Hi, I am Luis Herrera Estrella. I'm director of the National Laboratory of Genomics for Biodiversity in Irapuato, Mexico. This institute belongs to the Center for Research and Advanced Studies that has its main campus in Mexico City. So in sections one and two, I've been talking about plant nutrition and how important phosphorus is for plant nutrition and agricultural production. In this section, I'm going to talk about the use of genetic engineering to design a, a more environmentally friendly phosphorus fertilization system. So people have been talking about the phosphorus crisis. Uh, this has been reported in major journals, newspapers, uh, magazines, and scientific journals. What the problem they are talking about is that we have finite reserves of phosphorus in the world, and then if we keep using them at the same rate, we will end up with these uh, reserves and we will have major problems for food production. So as I mentioned in, in my previous talks, phosphate is the most limiting nutrient in natural and agricultural ecosystems. And about 70% of the world's arable land has problems of low phosphate availability. Therefore, farmers need to apply fertilizers to achieve high levels of productivity. Over 50 million tons of PI fertilizer are applied every year to achieve high productivity. So not only is a problem that uh, we are running the risk of depleting the res natural reserves of phosphate, but also because the less we have, the higher the price, and that directly affects food production. So we can see here the report of the food price index by FAO, which had a peak around 2008, and it has steadily increased in the last five years. So we can see here that exactly the same trend is followed by phosphate prices. We have a peak in 2008, which actually coincides with the peak of food index prices, and we have a steady growth in, in the phosphoric rock uh, prices that parallel the food index prices. So if we don't take measures rapidly, phosphate rock availability will dramatically affect uh, fertilizer supply and food prices. Um, high quality reserve of phosphoric rocks from which phosphate fertilizer is produced is not distributed around the world, but is actually concentrated in, in a few countries. So for instance, United States has some reserves, Russia, China, Iran, South Africa, but most of the reserves are accumulated in the Saharan Desert. So Morocco and the Sahara has about 70% of the uh, easily extracted uh, mines of phosphoric rock. So, as I mentioned before, phosphate rock reserves from which we obtain fertilizer are finite, and as consumption increases, the lifetime of the reserves decrease. How long will they last? It depends upon different uh, factors. One is if we increase production and we, we increase use of fertilizer, we maintain the fertilizer use or we decrease fertilizer use. But everybody agrees that between 70 and 150 years will be uh, the time in which we will start suffering from depleting the reserves of phosphoric rock. It's not only a problem of using excessive amounts of fertilizer. Why we use excessive amounts of fertilizers? The problem is that phosphate is very, very reactive with the soil components. It reacts depending upon the pH of the soil with different cations, aluminum, magnesium, calcium. So at acidic pHs reacts with some and alkaline pHs reacts with others. But that reaction makes them uh, form compounds which are not very soluble and therefore they are not available for plant uptake. So what do farmers do? They add excessive amounts of phosphate fertilizer. The problem is that the excess of fertilizer finally ends up in rivers, in lakes, and the sea, causing eutrophication and toxic algae blooms that kill fishes and, and uh, crustaceans and all type of living organisms. So this is a problem that has been increasing in the world and people has pointed out as one of the most important ecological problems in the world. 
Over 400 ocean dead zones have been reported to date all around the world, particularly in, in, in Eastern Europe, North America, South America, some parts of Africa, Japan, uh, and so on. So why we have this problem? The problem is that crops use only about 20 to 30 percent of the fertilizer applied in agriculture. We applied one kilogram and the plant uses only 20 percent and the rest becomes fixed into the soil because it reacts with the cations present in the soil or it is being used by microbes in the soil. Every organism needs phosphorus, so when we apply phosphate, bacteria and fungi and weeds eat the phosphate we apply, so we end up with a very low efficiency. It's one of the lowest efficiencies of any industrial process in the world. Phosphate fertilization and also nitrogen fertilization, only 20 to 30 percent of what we apply is used. So how can we overcome this problem? We need several things to be done. We need plants that produce more with the same amount of fertilizer. We need uh, systems that reduce the need of fertilizer, and we will need to recycle the waste of fertilizer. So if we don't do this, we will eventually run out of, of phosphate rock, and we will have no fertilizer to achieve high yields. So, one of the questions is, why do we only use phosphate as a fertilizer? We only use phosphate as a fertilizer because it's the only molecule that plants and all living organisms can metabolize. So if we could use chemical forms of phosphate, which are less reactive with cations and are not so easily consumed by microbes in the soil, we could develop a system which is more efficient and will be uh, more effective in terms of uh, uh, decreasing the environmental impact of agriculture. So phosphate were already proposed by German chemists after the Second World War as a superior alternative uh, source of phosphate fertilizer over phosphate. And this is because of its physicochemical properties. Phosphate is more soluble in the soil than phosphate. Phosphate solubility is the less dependent on pH than phosphate. Phosphate is, is less reactive with soil components, and phosphate is already used while in agriculture as an effective treatment against oomycet, against phytophthora, against diseases uh, caused by phytophthora. So no toxicity reported for humans and animals, but the problem is we don't know whether phosphite is actually a fertilizer. Phosphite is uh, sold as a systemic fungicide. This is a, this is a proven, a confirmed activity. It prevents infections by phytophthora. But this is also as a fertilizer. But what do we know as the action of phosphite as a fertilizer? Is it uh, really metabolizable by, by plants? And, and the answer is no. Plants cannot use phosphite as a pea soil. And this has been demonstrated over and over in many different plant species. Here we have a, a, a maize plants grown in a soil with a certain level of, of phosphate present, and it, they sustain relatively good growth. If we fertilize with phosphate, this growth is promoted, so they grow better. But if we add phosphite, the growth of the plant is actually not enhanced, but rather is decreased. And you can see this on the greenhouse conditions, and you can also see it on the field conditions. The plant grows well with, when you fertilize with phosphate, but they don't grow well with, when you fertilize with phosphate. So phosphate is a much better alternative as a fertilizer, because it could provide the plant with the phosphorus element that the plant needs. It's physicochemically much more adequate for, as a fertilizer, but the problem is that plants cannot metabolize phosphate as a phosphorus oil. So the question is, can we now use genetic engineering to produce plants capable of metabolizing phosphate? Phosphate is recognized by the plant as a signaling molecule because it suppresses the response of the plant 
uh, to low phosphate. But it cannot be metabolized. This is just a transcriptional analysis of what is the effect of phosphate on a plant uh, that is uh, grown on, under low phosphate conditions. So when you expose the plant to low phosphate, it, acti it activates the expressions or represses the expression of hundreds or thousands of genes. When you add phosphate to this plant, all the expression patterns is reversed, suggesting that phosphate is recognized as a signaling molecule, but it cannot be metabolized as phosphate. So, can we make plants capable of metabolizing phosphate? So, there is a report by the group of uh, Metcalf that identify a bacteria that is capable of oxidizing phosphate into phosphate, and therefore it can utilize phosphate as a phosphorus. So, what this bacteria does is self-fertilizes self using a molecule which is not a metabolite and converting this molecule into a metabolite, that is phosphate. So, the question is, can we introduce this gene into plants and now make, make them capable of using phosphate as a phosphorus source? The reaction is very simple. It depends on a single gene is, that encodes a phosphate oxidoreductase that oxidizes phosphate into phosphate using NADA as a cofactor and producing NADH, which is a high energy molecule that the plant can use to produce uh, carbohydrates. And the answer to this question is yes. When you introduce this gene into plants, you produce a genetically modified plant that contains this bacterial gene. Now you can produce plants capable of using phosphate. This is a, a, a wild-type control plant grown in soil without fertilizer. It has very little growth. If you fertilize with increasing amounts of phosphate, you get higher and higher growth. But if you fertilize with phosphate, you see no growth, suggesting that phosphate is not metabolized by uh, control plants. When you produce a transgenic plant, in the, in the absence of fertilization, it has a similar growth than the, the wild-type control. When you fertilize with phosphate, you get identical growth than the control plants. But when you add phosphate, now these plants are capable of using phosphate as a fertilizer. In contrast to the, the control, the original plants that are incapable of using it, now these plants are capable of using it. Now the crucial question is, if phosphate is less reactive with soil components and it cannot be uh, consumed by soil microbes, what happens when we fertilize this plant with phosphate and compare how much we need of phosphate and phosphate sus to sustain similar growth rates? And the answer is, here I'm showing you, this is experiments done in the greenhouse in which we grew control plants in fertilized with different amounts of of phosphate fertilizer, 10 parts per million, 30 parts per million, and 60 parts per million. And the same, but fertilized with phosphate. So the wild type controls don't grow because they cannot use phosphate as a fertilizer. And the transgenic lines, the genetically modified plants can grow. You can already see here that 10 parts per million of phosphate produce better growth than 10 parts per million of phosphate. This is because phosphate is less reactive with soil components, and it is not being consumed by the soil microbes that are present in this soil, which came from an agricultural field in, in Celaya, Mexico. Perhaps the most important is the quantification of what happens. So what happens, it can be total plant biomass, or it can be total seed biomass. And the important thing is that you achieve a certain amount of productivity with 60, 60 parts per million of phosphate, the white bars are the control plants, and the black bars are the transgenic. So when you fertilize with phosphate, you have no statistical difference between one and the other. When you fertilize with phosphate, you achieve the same productivity with 30 parts per million than when you use 60 parts per million of phosphate, suggesting that you can reduce between 30 and 50 percent the amount of fertilizers you need to grow these plants. So this is bringing an economical benefit in terms that we will use less fertilizer, 
but more importantly, probably, that we will have ecological benefits because reducing the amount of phosphate fertilizer will reduce algae blooms and it will reduce environmental impact. Another problem that has been commonly reported in the newspapers is that weeds are becoming resistant to traditional herbicides. The, the amazing impact of using herbicide-resistant genetically modified plants in the way agricultural is performed currently has made a very extensive use of traditional herbicides uh, such as glyphosate and uh, other types of chemical herbicides. So this has been reported in, in different um, journals, uh, newspapers and scientific journals, and, and sometimes is even exaggerated because now they call them super weeds because these plants are very aggressive and prevent agriculture. And when they become resistant to herbicides, now we have a problem to control their growth. So the question is, in the system we design, the plant becomes very competitive because now it can assimilate a fertilizer that other organisms cannot. So what happens when you grow a crop versus a weed when you fertilize with phosphate? So in these experiments, we are making a competition between a genetically modified plant, the little one that you see in the bottom of this tray, and a, and a grass weed. Grass weeds are very aggressive. They grow very rapidly. They produce a lot of seed. That's why they are, they are weeds. That, those are the characteristics, very rapid growth, a very rapid multiplication. If we fertilize with phosphate, we promote the growth of our crop, but also we promote the growth of the wheat. That's why we need a herbicide. We need to fertilize, and we used to apply, we need to apply a herbicide to kill this, this uh, weed and then allow our crop to grow. But when we fertilize with phosphate, we turn around the system because now the plant is more competitive than the weed because it can use phosphate and the weed cannot. Then our crop grows better than the weed. You can still see here a little bit of the weed pointing out of, of the tray. So this makes the system quite interesting because now we need less fertilizer and we need less herbicide. And this could have a, a, a phenomenal environmental impact because we want to eat food with less chemicals and we want to, to reduce the environmental impact of agriculture. This is a, a, a field evaluation of these transgenic lines in which you can see that depending upon the amount of phosphate fertilizer we apply, we see better growth of our genetically modified plant and lower growth of, of the weeds. We are not killing the weeds, we are just reducing the growth of the weeds. So if we don't apply phosphate, the weeds overgrow our genetically modified plant, and we don't see it. Here is the weeds that are just cover our genetically modified plant because there is no fertilizations, and the weed grows better on this soil. If we start applying phosphate, we see the growth of our transgenic plant, and if we reach about half of what you need as a normal phosphate fertilization using phosphate as a fertilizer, now you see your crop growing and a controlled growth of the wheat. This controlled growth of the wheat is actually quite interesting because agroecologists suggest that the best way of doing agriculture is not actually eliminating weeds because wheat help us to prevent soil erosion and water evaporation. With this system, we maintain the weeds, but they don't compete with our crop. So we can see our crop growing and, and, and we have an, an, an additional ecological benefit. So this technology can be applied to many crops. These are transgenic maize. They are genetically modified maize that are now capable of, of metabolizing phosphate. And this is the control parent, which is not modified and is unable to, to utilize phosphate as a phosphorus. The soybean, the soybeans can now utilize phosphate. And these are the control soybeans, which are unable to metabolize phosphate. So this is an example of how we can control a very important uh, a maize weed for, for maize production in Mexico. This is a climbing plant, is Ipomea purpurea. When you have the, the, the wheat here, it will start uh, growing on the maize plant and will uh, kill the plant. 
So if you, phos you fertilize with phosphite, you see the wheat growing quite happily, and it, it will eventually overgrow your crop. And you can also see here how many algae this substrate is growing green, because they, every organism in the soil likes phosphate. When you apply phosphite as a fertilizer, you can see now the, the wheat here, which is quite small, and the maize plant growing happily. But you can also see that there are no green stuff on the substrate, suggesting that phosphite doesn't prevent the growth of the microbes, but it doesn't stimulate the growth of the microbes. So it favors the growth of, the, of your crop, reduces the growth of your wheat, and it doesn't alter the, the, the ecology of the soil. The, 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 this system can also be used as a selectable marker to produce genetically modified plants. This is under tissue culture. Tobacco plants uh, uh, modify with, with the phos phosphite oxidizing gene. So you can see these little plants coming out, and the progeny of these plants grow, and the originals don't grow. You can also use as a selectable marker under greenhouse conditions. This is without a phosphate, a mixture of transgenic and non-transgenic plants. If you add phosphate, everybody grows. And if you add phosphate, only the transgenics grow, eliminating the non-transgenic plants. So this system allows you to uh, select plants under greenhouse conditions, making much cheaper the, the selection system to produce genetically modified plants. So in summary, this system allows you to reduce uh, phosphate fertilizer, the amount of phosphate fertilizer. And because it is in a chemical form that cannot be used by most organisms, when it reaches the ocean, it will not promote algae blooms, because algae cannot use phosphate as a, as a, as a phosphate source. So when you have agriculture and you fertilize with phosphate, it eventually ends up in the sea, and the small changes in, in phosphate concentration promote algae blooms that produce toxins and kill fishes and crustaceans and all living forms in, 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 in the ocean. If you apply phosphate, phosphate, you will reduce the amount of application, and it will eventually reach the ocean as, as phosphate, and, and it will cause no algae bloom. One question that people ask is, what will happen in the phosphate? We will contaminate phosphate. The, we will contaminate the world with phosphate. No, because phosphate naturally oxidizes into phosphate by the action of the atmospheric oxygen. So phosphate will not last more than a few months on the earth or the ocean or wherever. And there are also questions about what will happen with the microflora in the soil. We have done some experiments showing that uh, Application of phosphate doesn't actually alter the microflora, but when we add phosphate, which is actually metabolized by many microorganisms, causes a huge change in, in, in the soil microbial ecology because some bacteria grow faster than others and we change the ecology of the system. There are still many aspects of this technology that need to be tested under field conditions. We will start doing the test with, with maize and soybean to prove that the system is is robust for these crops under field conditions, and that we can sustainably use the technology and that we face no, no problems. So this is an example of how genetic modifications can help us to produce technology that, that will allow a more sustainable agriculture in which uh, reducing the environmental impact of agriculture is one of the major components. I just want to end up uh, uh, thanking some of the collaborators that have worked on this project. This is Damar Lopez Arredondo, who has uh, done most of the work uh, engineering plants to metabolize phosphate, and Sandra Gonzalez and Marco Antonio Leiva, who help us understanding what are the uh, responses of plants to phosphate. Thank you very much.